The final topic for this module is boundary conditions. What happens if an electromagnetic wave traveling in one medium is incident upon a second medium? What conditions do Maxwell's equations impose on the fields crossing that boundary? To answer this question, let's imagine a planar boundary where medium 1 is in region 1 above the boundary and medium 2 is in region 2 below the boundary. Medium 1 has material properties mu1 and epsilon1 and medium 2 has material properties mu2 and epsilon2. Now let's imagine a very small loop oriented with its normal vector tangential to the boundary. The loop is half sticking up into region 1 and half sticking down into region 2. Ampere's law says that if we integrate h dot dl around this loop, it has to equal the time derivative of the electric field through the loop plus the current through the loop. We're going to assume that the loop is so small that the fields are approximately constant along each of its edges and go around the loop one edge at a time to make the integration. Let's look first at the top edge of the loop. Here, since the edge is parallel to the surface, the integral of h dot dl is equal to the length of the edge, we'll call it delta l, times the part of the magnetic field in region 1 that is tangential to the surface, we'll call it ht1. Now we'll go down the left side of the loop. For the upper half of this edge, the integral of h dot dl is going to be the normal part of the magnetic field in region 1, hn1, times half the length of the edge plus the normal part of the magnetic field in region 2 times the other half of the edge. Then across the bottom edge of the loop, we have negative the tangential part of the magnetic field in region 2, negative because we're going in the opposite direction, times the length of that edge. And finally, up the right-hand side of the loop. The bottom half of this loop gives us negative hl over 2 times the normal part of the magnetic field in region 2, and the upper half of the loop gives us negative hl over 2 times the normal part of the magnetic field in region 1. So this is the result of integrating h dot dl around the loop. Notice that the terms that came from the left and right sides of the loop cancel out, leaving just the two terms associated with the top and bottom edges. So now let's look at the right-hand side of the equation. Since we're assuming that the loop is very small, the d field going through the upper half of the loop is just d1, the d field in the medium one, times the area of the upper half of the loop, which is hl over 2 times delta l. Similarly, the d field going through the lower half of the loop is d2 times hl over 2 times delta l. And the current going through the loop will just be js times delta l, where js is the surface current on the boundary that is assumed to be directed through the loop. So this is our equation for the loop. And to get the equation for the boundary itself, we're going to let hl, the height of the loop, go to zero. So both of our d field terms will go away, and the delta l terms cancel, and we get that the tangential magnetic field in the first region minus the tangential magnetic field in the second region is equal to the surface current density on the boundary. This is the first boundary condition. We can perform a similar integration around the same loop using Faraday's law to show that the tangential electric field in the first region is equal to the tangential electric field in the second region. So this is the second boundary condition. Next, let's consider Gauss's law over a small box that is located half in region 1 and half in region 2. Like before, we're assuming that this box is small enough that the fields don't vary over its faces. So the integral of d dot ds on the top of the box will be the normal part of the d field in the first region times the area of the top of the box, and the integral on the bottom of the box will be negative the normal part of the d field in the second region times the area of the bottom of the box. And the integral around the sides of the box will be zero because anything coming in one side will flow right out the other side. So this is what we get for the left-hand side of Gauss's law. On the right, we have the total charge contained by the box. And as we let the height of the box go to zero, that becomes the area times the surface charge density that is situated on the boundary. And now we see that the area term, delta A, cancels out of each of these terms, leaving dn1 minus dn2 equal to the surface charge density, rho s. If we remember that d is equal to epsilon e, this may also be written like this. This is the third boundary condition. 
Finally, let's apply the solenoidal law to that same box. Here again, we'll perform the surface integral over all the surfaces of the box, and what we obtain is that the normal part of the magnetic flux density in the first region is equal to the normal part of the magnetic flux density in the second region. If we recall that B is equal to mu H, this may be rewritten like this. So this is the fourth boundary condition. These are the four boundary conditions we've just derived. Anytime you have a wave passing from one medium into another, the fields must obey these conditions. We'll put these to good use in the next module when we talk about waves being transmitted and reflected at material boundaries.